Logic programming is a declarative programming style based on symbolic logic and predicate calculus. A predicate is simply a symbol that represents some property of a variable or a relationship between variables. For example, we could have a predicate man that indicates that Jacob is man. Or we could have a predicate parent that indicates some sort of relationship between Jacob and Eli. Now, strictly speaking, this definition doesn't say anything about who is the parent, whether Jacob's the parent or Eli is the parent. The, the meaning behind the predicate has to come from elsewhere. Logic simply says that this is a true fact. And so these are specific values, not really variables. We're saying that a specific individual, Jacob, has the property of man, whatever that is, and the specific individuals, Jacob and Eli, have a relationship, parent, whatever that is. Now, in typical symbolic logic, we could combine this information to derive new facts. For example, I could say that man... Jacob, and then I'm going to use a symbol, which means and. So this little upward notch is a logical and. So Jacob, man, and parent, Jacob, Eli. These facts in combination imply, that's what this arrow symbol means, or say this and this implies a new predicate father, Jacob, Eli. So this is a single sentence using predicates. It's a logical statement. Jacob's a man and Jacob is a parent of Eli, implies that Jacob is a father of Eli. Note that I imparted some extra meaning into these predicates by making a solid statement about what the ordering means. Now, this is a statement about specific individuals, but we can generalize this to any individuals like so. So here we're using a symbol that looks like an upside down A. This is known as a universal quantifier. And when you're explaining what this logical sentence means, we often just translate this as for all. To translate this into English, I would say, for all values of x and y, if x is a man and x is a parent of y, that implies that x is a father of y. So notice that the x and the y are quantified over the entire expression. Now, strictly speaking, the x and the y have to come from some domain of possible values. Um, but in this statement, any values that satisfy the what we say the left hand side of that arrow um, will also satisfy the right hand side so because we're deriving this new fact about this predicate on the right hand side what we've basically done is define what it means to be a father you are a father if you are a man and a parent in logic programming we generally define predicates as opposed to defining procedures or functions. Now, even though this is a valid sentence in predicate logic, um, this is not the form that we would see things expressed in in an actual logic programming language. The details vary by language, but typically the forms of logical sentences that are allowed are restricted to a specific form known as a horn clause named after the logician Alfred Horn. Now in a Horn clause, we put the fact that we're implying on the left of the implication. So we say that father XY is implied by man X and parent XY. Now for the specific example I'm working with, it looks like all I did was reverse the order of the implication and remove the universal quantifier. 
So with horn clauses, we don't have a universal quantifier. It's always implied. So we are still making a claim that this is true for all values of X and Y. But there's more to horn clauses than simply reversing implication. Basically, with a horn clause, the left-hand side of an implication is only allowed to be a single predicate. And there's actually two forms of horn clauses. So we can either have a form like this, where we have one predicate that is implied by some logical expression, or we can have what's known as a standalone fact. This is basically what we saw earlier in the video when I was writing things like man Jacob. So this is also a horn clause. It's a headless horn clause. The idea being that the left-hand side of the arrow is the head of a horn clause. But if you don't have an arrow at all, then this fact is more like the right-hand side of this other horn clause. So it's a horn clause without a head. So this is the head. When you have a horn clause that does have an implication, then this right side is the body. Now let me show you a logical sentence that is valid in symbolic logic, but that is not a horn clause. So I could have an example with two predicates on the left-hand side of an implication. So I could say father x, y, or, so this V symbol, this sort of upside down version of the logical and, this means or, or logical or. So I could say father x, y, or mother x, y. So this is a new predicate that we haven't seen yet, but I think you can guess what it means. And so I'm going to say father x, y, or mother x, y is implied by parent x, y. So this is a reasonable sentence in symbolic logic. And in terms of meaning, it also makes sense. If you're a parent, you're either a father or a mother. We could get really strict and, you know, debate whether a logical or versus an exclusive or makes sense here. But that's beside the point. It's fair for me to write this in logic. And whether it's true or not, it is at least syntactically correct. However, it is not a horn clause because a horn clause can only have a single fact on the left-hand side of that arrow. So it may seem as though these requirements severely restrict what can be done with logic programming, but logic programs are Turing complete and can often express certain programs more succinctly than a typical procedural program. The details depend on the specific language you're using, but here is a slightly more complex example written using generic logic syntax. So I'm going to say that the factorial of 0 is 1. So I'm using numbers now, but I'm still making a logical claim that the factorial of 0 is 1. So just a reminder, this is this syntax with the exclamation mark. So um, you know, zero factorial equals one. Uh, and you may remember that, you know, one factorial also equals one and that two factorial equals two. The reason that it equals two is because it equals two times one and that three factorial equals six because it equals three times two times one. Now a recursive definition for factorial based on functions would say that zero factorial is one and that n factorial is n times n minus one factorial. Um, and this is only true for values of n that are greater than zero. So we have a case structure here and there's other ways you could write this definition but this would be more akin to a definition you'd have in functional programming. We're doing a definition in logic programming. So this is our base case, but how do we define a recursive case for our predicate? So I'm going to say that the factorial of n 
equals n times some value x, and this is true or implied if n is greater than zero and the factorial of n minus one is equal to x. And that's it. Now I'll point out that some of the syntactical tricks I'm using here would not work in certain actual real logic programming languages. We'll explore those details in a future video. But this example still gives you a sense for how problem solving and also recursion work in a logic programming language. Let me finish up this video by walking through a derivation or example of how this would work with some actual values plugged in. So because we know how factorial works, it should be clear that if I say, you know, factorial 2, 2, this is a true claim. It is true that the factorial of 2 is 2 because 2 equals 2 times 1. So that's it. And I could also say that, you know, the factorial of 5 equals 120. And so this is another true claim. But programming is not useful if I can just verify things I already know. I need to be able to compute things. And so typically in a logic programming language, you would have a query of some sort. So rather than just give it the answer, I might say, okay, the factorial of four is some value answer. Now, based on input like this, a logic programming language would be able to infer what the value of answer should be. And so how would it do that? Well, if we take this definition, we know that four is not zero. So clearly we're not in this first case, this is a base case. So we're gonna look at our recursive case. So if the recursive case is true, then it means that this answer is equal to four times some value X, but I don't know what X is. So this is only gonna be true if I can figure out um, a value of X based on this recursive definition here. Now, I also have to verify that N is greater than zero, but it is in this case because here four is the N. And so it is true that four is greater than zero. And I'm gonna say that I have factorial N minus one, that's three and that equals x. So if 4 is greater than 0 is true, which it is, and the factorial of 3 is x, then the factorial of 4 is 4 times x. Well, that might be true, but I don't know if factorial 3 of x, 3 and x is equal. So I have to verify this step. So I recursively continue this process. Now to make this process easier to understand, I'm going to put little subscripts on the values of x. So this is the first x we've seen. So that's x1 and that's also x1 here. So those are the same x. But of course, whenever we do a recursive call, we're introducing a new variable with the same name, but I'll use subscripts to differentiate the different versions of x in each level of the recursion. So is it true that factorial of three is X1? Well, that's true if X1 is actually equal to three times X2, where the following is true of X2. So we might have this here. So we know that three is greater than zero. And we also know that factorial of, so, going to be n minus 1, so 3 minus 1 is 2, so factorial of 2 is x2. And x2 would have to equal 2 times x3, some other variable we haven't seen yet. So this is true if 2 is greater than 0, 
which it is, and factorial and 2 minus 1 would be 1 of x3. So that's where the x3 comes in. So if factorial of 1 is x3, then we can plug that x3 into there times by 2 to get what x2 is. But we're not done yet. So is 1 greater than 0? Yes, it is. And we check to see that factorial of, so 1 minus 1 is 0. And then here, we're not using the original factorial definition. So up here, we had um, factorial of n when n is greater than 0. But 0 is not greater than zero, so we're going to rely on the base case definition. Factorial of zero is one. So here we put in a value of one, and it turns out that this x3 here, that is going to be one times that one. And so now we can unwind this and show that it works. So is it true that the factorial of zero is one? Yes, it is true. That's our base case right there. So we know it's true. We've stated it as a fact. This is a headless horn clause. It's a known fact. So this is true. Is one greater than zero? Yes, that's true. Because this and this are true, it implies that this previous fact, factorial of one is x3, is true if x3 equals one times one, which is one. So a value of 1 goes there. We know that factorial 1 comma 1 is true. We know that 2 is greater than 0. So these two facts are true. That means that factorial 2 comma x2 is also true, given that x2 is 2 times x3, where the x3 came from here. We can get rid of this. We can actually compute 2 times 1. That's the value of x2. So this is... 2, which is also going to go here in a moment. And so now we know that factorial 2, 2 is true, and we already know that 3 is greater than 0. And so because these are both true, it means that this fact is true, where the x1 equals 3 times 2. And so that x1 is 6, and that same x1 will go here. And so factorial 3 is 6, and 4 is greater than 0. And because those facts are true, it implies that the factorial of 4 is 4 times 6, which is 24. And using our knowledge of arithmetic, uh, we know that is correct. So that is an example in a very generic syntax of how problem solving and recursion work in a logic programming language. Now, in upcoming videos, I'll talk about more advanced topics, and I'll present real code in real logic languages, specifically Prolog and Mercury.